I'm very excited to be sharing this powerful film experience and its creator, Andrew Solomon. Andrew, you want to wave with you? Andrew is professor of clinical medical psychology in psychiatry at Columbia University Medical Center. He is a native New Yorker, journalist, activist, moth radio presenter, and raconteur extraordinaire. Andrew received a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from Yale University and a Master's degree in English and Ph.D. degree in psychology at Jesus College, Cambridge. He has been a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine, as well as writing for the New Yorker, Travel and Leisure, Art Forum, and many other periodicals. In addition to his book and documentary, Far From the Tree, he won the National Book Award for his earlier work, The Noonday Demon, An Atlas of Depression. Welcome, Andrew. As I immersed myself in this film to select the clips you are about to see, I felt I got to know Andrew on a personal level, and I will leave you to that same experience in reviewing this series of film clips, which offers a deeply intimate window into his life. It was not difficult to decide what segments to include in this presentation, but incredibly difficult to decide what to cut out to fit into this limited time frame. What you will see tonight is a touching portrayal of parents who have children who are very different in some way from themselves and the challenges to loving and accepting them and how love conquers that challenge. And for the, <clears throat> excuse me, the children who are different from their parents, the power of finding their subgroups, not in their vertical identities with their families, but in their horizontal identity with others. I trust that this experience tonight will inspire you to view the film in its entirety on Hulu or Amazon Prime. We are so grateful to IFC Films Unlimited for allowing us to show these clips. I also want to thank my incoming co-chair, Tom Stone, who worked with me in selecting the film segments, and his son, Jacob, who masterfully put them into this format for us to share. In addition to spending time with this film, I've been listening to the audiobook of Far From the Tree, which includes so much more breadth and depth on this topic, 40 hours of listening. I've actually been hearing your voice, Andrew, daily for the last several months, and I'm so excited to finally meet you in person. After this 30-minute viewing, I will have a 15-minute conversation with Andrew and then open the floor to a few questions. Afterward, the book will be on sale somewhere, uh, right outside, okay, right outside, and Andrew will be available to sign copies. All that said, let's begin the film. Thank you. Once, this guy said to me, man, if I were you, I'd probably kill myself. You know, just by seeing me and my, my body in a wheelchair, he thought that I must be miserable. And, um, you know, I think that it's probably um, a pretty common assumption. And so what body you're in has everything to do with your perspective of the world. You wake up and you can't pretend Your dream was just a dream again Won't you dry your eyes But it doesn't matter anymore Do just what you did before Until you realize The words go la 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 It was not a normal mother-son relationship Ever <laughs> Jack, do you want to hear the volume? It was overwhelming. I didn't want it. I didn't want it. You can dip your brain in joy. Once we understand, no one understands it all. Silly 
I think in some ways I wrote the book to understand what happened. And maybe I wrote it to forgive my parents. I think my mother imagined that her firstborn son would be part of the real mainstream, the kind of kid who was popular at school, athletic, at ease in the world, and basically quite conventional. And instead, she got me. When I was growing up, I had a lot of weird hang-ups. I mean, I refused to wear blue jeans. I refused to listen to rock music of any kind. I was obsessed with Emily Dickinson's poems of anguish and told my friends the plots of operas. I was a weirdo. And, you know, my parents were really good. My mom in particular, she would sort of get on board with the things that interested me, even when they were a little bit strange. I feel like there was a lot of leeway for me to be different in all kinds of ways. But my parents really didn't want to have a gay son. And I thought if I tell them I'm gay, they're going to be brutally disappointed. And I told them, and they were. It was a catastrophe. I wanted to understand why my parents dealt with me the way they did. I wanted to see how other families managed it. I thought I don't want to know just about families of gay people. I wanted to look as widely as I could. I set out to write Far From the Tree, which was my attempt to investigate how families go about dealing with children who are very different from them. I spent 10 years researching and writing this book. We look at things like dwarfism, an autistic child, a child who commits a crime. It's a tough thing sometimes for a parent to reconcile with. There are some children who are born with an identity or a way of being or a set of priorities that are completely foreign to his or her parents. The stories I heard felt so alien at the beginning, but bit by bit, they came to feel very real and very intimate to me. And I realized that in telling these stories, I was investigating the very nature of family itself. This actually looks very modernistic. This could be by Picasso. Oh, yeah. Doesn't that look very modern? And look at this. Looks like turn the world around. Turns out it looks like what? Turn, turn the world around like Harry Belafonte. Yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed it does. I think that's where they got their inspiration for those masks. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> 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 Where is everybody? We are the last people on the planet. Hello. <laughs> when Jason was born, the doctor said, What we do with children like this is we send them away before an attachment is formed. <laughs> She's so ludicrous that an obstetrician doesn't understand that you have spent nine months forming an attachment. What did they think this was? They respond to Because Jason started accomplishing things. We have four bagels and you take away one bagel. We were so excited. It was such a miracle. Hey, you know what? Can you count to ten in Spanish? Okay. Uno. He walked, he talked, and he did all kinds of things that he was not supposed to do. What does it mean to be retarded? Do they think like we do? Do they have the same feelings? And now I'd like you to meet Emily and Charles Kingsley, 
Jason's parents. He's now reading on a second grade level. The child they told us to junk and throw away is doing second grade reading, first grade math. And he became a bit of a celebrity. Meet Jason Kingsley. You might think Down syndrome hardly gets in his way. I was studying sound and electricity and energy. I literally thought, well, this is a piece of cake. This is this is really this is really thrilling. And they must have been just plain wrong. I worked here um, about 18 years. I delivered the mail and delivered the packages. When I work here, I mostly work independently. Keeps me learning. Keeps me on my toes. I think slowly, but I'm smart in, in my own way. I'm mostly with emotions. I mean, sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm a little bit sad. You have a great weekend, okay? Okay. See you next time. See you next time. Take care. Bye. Bye. Basically, I'm just a normal guy. Here we go. I live with your name. And wait a minute. We are the Three Musketeers. And I like my life now until something better happens. Okay, ready? Okay, we're pushing. There's your man. All the equipment and everything. He's got all the parts. Oh, yeah. Jack. Jack, Jack, Jack. A yellow hood. Hi, buddy. It's a duck. Happy birthday, dear Jack. Happy birthday, Jack. Jack was just such a happy, crazy little guy for the first year and a half, two years. Hi, my boy. And to look at those videos now and to see that and then go, wow, that's gone. That's never coming back. Jack wants to go for a wagon ride. Bye-bye! Wave, Jackie! I remember we were outside one day, and this giant jumbo jet flew overhead. Jackie! And I'm like, Jack, look at the plane. He didn't look. Hey, Jackie, can you wave bye-bye? No. He didn't say bye. Bye, bro. He wasn't using words. Jack! Jackie! You know, I thought maybe it was a hearing thing. Hey, Jackie. Hi, hey, Jackie. Merry Christmas. And finally, a psychologist came. Show me the chair. Touch your nose. That was in January. And by July, we knew. He had autism. And because he never spoke to us, I just assumed that he was impaired and that he couldn't understand us. He's for mommy. But he had no idea what was going on. You have to sit in your chair. Let me take this. Wave again. Hey, buddy. Wave. You wave? Maybe not. And I researched everything, and we were of the mentality we're going to do everything we can. So we did. If there was anything out there, we jumped on it. We did music therapy where they're playing Mozart and while they're doing physical therapy. We did allergy testing. It's all a naturopath, chiropractor. He was eating a gluten-free, dairy-free diet, so I was having to shop at specialty stores. And did hyperbaric oxygen therapy where you go and sit in a high-pressure oxygen tank with a, he's got like a spaceman hood on. 
We were doing homeopathy at the time with a group out in Texas. Of course, he wouldn't take pills at that time, so we had to put it in this awful little slurry and get it into them and mix it with juice, and it was just real time-consuming and horrifically expensive. Here it is. Who is it? And we spent years on speech therapy. We thought that he, he should talk. We talk. So he needs to learn how to talk. But he was so angry and so frustrated. Nothing worked. I blamed it on everything. I blamed it on the medicine that I was on when I was pregnant. I blamed it on the bed rest. I blamed it on my health. Like maybe I wasn't as healthy as I could have been when I was pregnant with him. I blamed myself for all of it. Like I caused it. Sun gives us heat. H So in Austin, we walk into a room and this short little lady walks in and doesn't really talk to us and then she just started talking to Jack. And it was four days. She had a stack of paper and a couple pencils. And she had templates with letters cut out in them, three of them. And she showed him how to take the pencil and point to the letter. So she kind of walked him through the first couple. Yes, and then she started asking questions, and then she would answer. She'd say the word, she'd write the word, and then she'd get him to spell it. We were thinking, okay, this, this, is, this is good. It's almost a parlor trick, but that's fine. Then she started to ask more abstract questions. This text didn't take me anything about neutral. It was a very tedious, long process. We were often running, asking him all kinds of questions about, you know, what's, do you like sports? What's your favorite sport? And he wanted a blue basketball. Now she got her attention. And she said, Jack just can't control his body, but you've got to keep going. You have to just talk to him, and you've got to ignore this. This is him. His body has taken over. you just got to work through it. You know, toward the end of the week, he was exhausted. He was having a huge tantrum. Huge. And she would say, what's the matter, Jack? Let's talk about it. What's the matter? And through his rage, he started spelling letters with the stencils. He typed out, I am trying, and I am really smart. And then Jack was perfectly quiet. He was like, oh, I finally got it out after all these years. And that was, that was, <laughs> that was the moment when I just went, my God, he's in there. I couldn't believe it. It was like I was meeting him for the first time. Like, oh my God. You're real? Can she ask another question, Jack? Yeah. You gotta tell your story. Mm -hmm. 
Can you do one more question? <laughs> yeah. He said yes. Yeah. He said yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, can you describe what it feels like for you to, to not be able to talk? H. E. Keep going. Hmm? that letter so you get it right. G. E. F. <laughs> the feeling is like a tiger in a cage. For a long time, I thought that being gay was something you could make the best of, but that gay relationships were in some basic way lesser than straight relationships. I had realized that I couldn't fix the fact that I was gay, but I still regretted it. And there was a piece of me that felt broken. And the idea that you could accept or even celebrate the forms of your brokenness didn't come to me until a great deal later, when the world around me changed. The shift that has taken place over the course of the last 40 years or so, has been of a scale that is almost unimaginable. And I became fascinated by the process through which that happened. How did we get from there to here? And how did something that was understood could be an illness come instead to be an identity? And that was what drove my investigation. And having lived to see my supposed defect come to be celebrated, I wondered whether defectiveness itself might be all a matter of perspective. And if it's possible for the illness of homosexuality to turn into the identity of gayness, in what other instances might the world's point of view change? How do we decide what to cure, and what to celebrate. I'm 23, but I guess that in a way I don't feel like an adult. My brother and sister, they're very protective, but they don't know what it's like to be me. They don't really quite understand as much as they think they do. I come home every day at lunch. I just to check up on her um, because I know that she gets bored. It's, she gets uh, depressed sometimes. She wants to go to work. She wants to drive a car. But I can't afford a special car for her. I would like to, you know, go out more. Travel, maybe. You know, maybe someday have a boyfriend. Have a date. No. Still single. <laughs> Growing up, I never really 
knew that people like me existed in the world. I saw them on TV, but I've never met any up close or in person. So I'm curious, you know, wondering, is there anybody out there like me? Register? Uh-huh. It is your first time. Awesome. Yeah. That's exciting. Let's see what you signed up for. A small t-shirt, a group photo, and two trivia night tickets. And are you entering the fashion show? No. Oh, you should. It's so much fun. It'll be a great way to meet other people around your age, too. Who's excited for a great show tonight? My friend Mads. She's my age, a little bit younger, but she's in the same boat as I am. Oh my gosh! I'm a I'm usually at three. <laughs> I have toe rings and they fit perfectly. It is wonderful finding someone who's like you. It's awesome. <laughs> I found uh, my first friend who can understand me. Great. I think people come to these meetings to be heard. I think they come to be seen. And then I think they come to disappear. used to confuse love and acceptance and through this whole process I felt unloved by my parents but as I went along meeting all of these people and hearing their stories I found that everyone who has kids has kids with flaws and problems and nobody goes around saying I'd like to turn my kids in for a better model you you love your children. It isn't really up to you. They just have come along and and changed you. Sometimes I wish I didn't have Down syndrome. We would have gone to college, I would have um, drove, I would have gotten married. But that's sort of like the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. What happens if I wasn't born? And I wouldn't have met my roommates. If I said hello to them, it will be as, as as strangers. We wouldn't be friends. It will be erased. Uh, um, it will be erased if, if I decided to wish I didn't have Down syndrome. So um, I may have to um, so I, I may have to um, stick to what, what I have.
And we are now having a spinner, but we do have three and low. We can do that. Careful with this. Because it's a side effect. We have to be careful with that. What's a side effect? Careful. I think yeah, that it's the same job. I'm gonna old. <laughs> if you're getting old, I'm getting old too. <laughs> we, we all are. The three of us, we made 13 years in this house. Same number. 13 years in this house. We always find ways how to get along. Exactly, we always do. Is that right, Jace? It's not just how, about how we get along, it's about, um, it's sort of like what's the word. And what I'm trying to say is that, that, that we became we became something. What? Friends. Deeper than that. How much deeper? Family? Family. That, thank you, Ray. That we became a family because we've been living, living in this house. And I think it should be officially uh, family of friends. Or this? Or for one more for all. Or for one and one for all. Yeah. He is not what we thought he was going to be, and he's not like us at all. Can you close your mouth? That's it. Okay. Both hands up here in the scrub. Ready? Both hands up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I tell him you're not normal, but that's not so bad. Uh, normal is pretty average, and you're well above average. I mean, you are. Is, uh, he's abnormal in a really good way. T H E the P E P R E. My best friend is Grant. He lives the damn autistic life like me. plateaus in his autistic mind. A real boy has a future like anyone else. The day was awesome cause I was with my tribe. This day forward, from this day forward, all of us, every one of us, has mountains that we have to climb. And we have to do it. We have to climb those mountains if we want our ultimate fulfillment. And the reason I'm telling you this is because no one knows better than I do. Andrew has had his mountains to climb, difficult mountains to climb. 
I could wish no more for you, Andrew and John, than a marriage such as I had with Andrew's mother. Only longer. Thank you. I think I had grown up with a sense that there was a right way to be. We hereby make our assault on conventional morality. (laughs) Writing the book set me free. broke me finally out of that particular narrowness that had been inscribed in my childhood. And it gave me the courage to have a family in a different way from the way I'd imagined growing up. You have a sword and you have a fishing rod. That seems very appropriate. And I've got a fishing rod with bait on it. Oh, what's the bait? Oh, that little bit of seaweed. Do you think there are fish in this water? George, let's go and put on your pajamas, please. Pajamas, please. George, pajamas. I tend to find the ecstasy hidden in ordinary joys because I did not expect those joys to be ordinary to me. Book five, right? Right. The first chapter is called How Shasta set out on his travels. Chapter 15 is called Radabash the Ridiculous. Okay, should we start reading the book? Would you like me to read it to you? Yes. Who is Shasta anyway? Oh, we'll find out. I guess we're going to find out. This is the story of an adventure that happened in <clears throat> Narnia and Kellerman and the lands between us. John and I have a big, spectacular family. Your best not to, probably. John is the biological father of two children with some lesbian friends in Minneapolis. Oh, you can't, you can't um, give him a Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, no, it doesn't really My best friend from college and I decided we'd like to have a child, and so we have a daughter. Something's so pretty. And then John and I have a son, George, who lives with us full time. Are you and when we had George, our surrogate, with Laura, the mother of John's two biological children. So there are six parents of four children in three states. You know, Tolstoy said, all happy families are the same. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And I used to think that might be true. But actually, I think a lot of unhappiness is quite similar. And that what's remarkable is all of the different ways people find to be happy. You ready, Freddie? So I hope this showing didn't feel too shockingly brief. <laughs> um, we selected these clips in large part because they illustrated the power of group affiliation in people's lives. And I can only imagine how hard it was for you to immerse yourself in the lives of those families in, for years and then figure out what to include in the 950-page book and then what to include and add in the documentary. What was that like for you? Well, the book essentially involved interviews with 300 families, um, and uh, most of whom are in there. And the documentary essentially focuses on six. You didn't see all of them tonight, but there are six families in there. We decided not to use the same families who had been in the book, with the exception of Emily Kingsley and her son Jason, who has Down syndrome and whom you saw in the film just now, because uh, what you want for a book is people to whom something interesting has happened who can recount it. And what you want for a film is people to whom something interesting is happening so that you can follow it. And it was a very different set of demands. 
But I felt, I was talking to someone just earlier this evening about the fact that the book is quite uh, long. I felt that if I wanted to make the book's profound underlying argument, which is that all of these various kinds of difference are in many ways very similar, and that while if you're dealing only with other families of people with Down syndrome or autism or schizophrenia, you're dealing with a small subset of the population, if you think every family that has a child who is profoundly different from what the parents accepted, uh, expected um, uh, has something in common, and that all of those families go through some kind of complicated process in which they ultimately, at least in many instances, are able to wind up grateful for lives they would have done anything to avoid. I felt to make that state when I had to go quite deeply into these various conditions and these various ways of life and these various families so that it didn't seem as though I had just skated across the surface of what I was contemplating, but rather uh, as though I spoke from a position of authority. Um, but I really, I really was compelled by, uh, by the experiences people had had and I suppose in the context of this particular meeting, I was compelled by the sense that there was and could be great community among them. I had a book party when the book was published, and after the party, um, I got a postcard from three people who had met at the party. And one was a dwarf, and one was a woman who was transgender, and one was the father of an autistic child. And they had all met and liked one another and had arranged to go and have dinner together. And they said, you know what? We wouldn't have thought it, but you were right. We do have a lot in common. And it really warmed my heart to feel that that sense of community was something that could be found through this process. That's wonderful, yeah. That's what I noticed as well. There's a lot of overlap and intersectionality, if you will. Yes. Yes. Um, When did you begin the work? What year was it when you began the work? I sold the idea in the very beginning of 2002, and I published the book in 2012. So it was a 10-year process uh, altogether. Um, I guess actually I sold it at the very end of 2001, but it was it was nearly the beginning of 2002. So it was a very uh, protracted process. And it was strange to be starting it in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, when I felt that people were grasping for a sense of community and connectedness and attachment uh, to be able, under those circumstances, to try to uh, to try to spin this uh, this narrative. But I had been assigned a piece by my editors at the Times Magazine about deaf culture. And I was very surprised at the time, that was back in the mid-90s, because I had always thought that deafness was a tragic disability. These poor people, they couldn't hear. What could we do for them? And I was very surprised when I went into the deaf world to discover that deafness was in fact a culture organized around the shared use of ASL or other sign languages. And as I spent more and more time in the deaf world, I came to understand that it was not only a culture, but that it was also quite a beautiful culture. And then I discovered that most deaf children are born to hearing parents, that those parents have tended with the very best of intentions to try to help their children function in what they think of as the real world, the hearing world, and that those children often discover deaf identity in adolescence or thereafter when it comes as a great liberation to them. And I thought that situation was incredibly similar to my experience as a gay person and to the larger experience of gay people, mostly born to straight parents, often parents who would really like them to function in what they think of as the mainstream world. Uh, And many gay people discover a sense of identity in adolescence or thereafter when it comes as a revelation. And then a friend of a friend of mine had a daughter who was a dwarf. And I thought, here it is again. Here is this whole thing again. And I remember when I was working on the deaf section, and it was really a revelatory moment to me that I went to a meeting of the National Association of the Deaf, which um, took place in Tennessee. And I was with a couple of my deaf friends, and we walked into this gigantic hall, and there were hundreds of people with their conversations flying off the ends of their hands. Mm -hmm. And I thought for a moment, I wish I were deaf which is not to say that I wish I couldn't hear because my hearing is very useful to me, but I saw that there was a certain intimacy in the experience that these people shared and that there was a lot of joy in it. And in that moment, I was the outsider. That's interesting because one of my questions was, it it seemed as I was listening to the book that you were practically embedded in families for long periods of time, and it must have felt like Um, You became part of those families, and yet you were not. Um, And what was that like? 
Well, I mean, I still feel embedded in many of those families, and in some cases that's a source of great joy and celebration, and in other cases it can be a little exhausting yeah. just because there were so many of yeah. them. Um, but when I worked on the book, as I said, there were 300 families. There were some families whom I interviewed once, and we spent two or three hours together, and I more or less got their story, and we never had any further contact, and I wrote it up, and it was very easily done. And there were other families whom I interviewed repeatedly over almost the entire 10 years that I was working on the book and developed a very profound and deep relationship with. And my idea in the way that I wrote the book was that the reader shouldn't automatically know which ones were which, um, that there should be a sense of fluidity and flow from one story to the next. Um, But, I mean, the stories were... And the, the experience of being with those families, it felt like a very privileged position. Mm-hmm. I felt a lot of people who had no good reason to opened up lives and opened up the most difficult parts of their lives to me. And again, in the film, we had the same experience. I mean, there, um, when we worked on the film, we spent um, the first year talking to people without any cameras in the room so that they could get used wow. to us and we could figure out what we had to say to one another. And then we brought the cameras in, and by that time they were comfortable enough so that the cameras, and, you know, it wasn't a lot of cameras, um, but so that the cameras were uh, no longer so disorienting to them. Um, But, you know, it's hard to walk into the house of a total stranger and start asking all of these questions. And a lot of the time the people whom I was asking told their stories with considerable pain and difficulty. I mean, you saw even in those excerpts from the film, there were a number of uh, times when parents were in tears. And I would say to them over and over again, in the book especially, but also in the film, clearly it's very painful for you to talk about these things. Why did you decide to do this interview? And they said over and over again, when I was going through these experiences, I felt very alone in them. And if my talking to you could possibly help someone else to feel less alone going through similar experiences, then it's worth whatever difficulty is involved. That's lovely, yes. So I'm just going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to open it up for a few um, audience questions. Um, What would you say was the most profound learning that came for you from this epic process? How did it change you? Well, it changed me in a lot of ways. I mean, I think what it really helped me to see was the role of volition in people's experience of family, which is to say that one of the... um, There was one family I talked to who had two children with multiple very, very severe disabilities, and they ended up being... um, uh, The mother wanted to keep them home as long as she possibly could, but they effectively had no motor control and were therefore a dead weight in her hands. And they never learned to um, speak, um, and they were never able to feed themselves, so they were really very, very disabled. And when she herniated a disc trying to lift one of them um, up out of bed, she decided they would have to go to a group home. And so they went to a group home where one of them died tragically through caregiver neglect. And when I talked to the mother about what had happened, she said, people keep saying to me that I should bring a lawsuit or I should do something. She said... Taking care of children like ours is so difficult, and it's so badly compensated, and I don't want to do anything that will frighten other people out of doing it. She said, so while I would like to get a legal um, a, a decision, which she did, that this particular woman should not be allowed to deal with populations as vulnerable as our children because she isn't responsible enough to do so, she said, I would not want to sort of make a big front-page lawsuit out of it. And I went to the internment of the ashes of that son. And at the internment of the ashes, she said, let me bury here the rage I feel to have been twice robbed. Once of the child I wanted and once of the son I loved. And another mother who I talked to also had two children with very serious disabilities who both died in adolescence said, people always give us these little sayings like God doesn't give you any more than you can handle. But children like ours are not preordained as a gift. They're a gift because that's what we have chosen. And it was that process of choice that I think was the biggest revelation to me. I knew early on that um, uh, children of parents who saw some good in their experience tended to do much better on virtually every measure than children of parents who didn't. 
but I thought some people happen to see these things and some people happen not to see them. And then I began to see it's an act of will and it's a decision to find that meaning. And it's a decision that often has to be supported by community, by family, by psychotherapists, by doctors, by everyone. And that it's the process of being allowed to find meaning in your experience that allows you ultimately to have both a better life for yourself as a parent and to give your child a better life than he or she could ever have had otherwise. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. So we don't have time for comments from the audience, but we do have time for a few brief questions before Andrew moves to signing books. So I have a microphone here. You interviewed the Columbine parents. I'm just curious, how did they deal with that tragedy? I did. I interviewed the parents of Dylan Klebold, who was one of the perpetrators of the Columbine massacre. And in the full film, there's also the story of a family of someone who had committed an atrocious um, murder. I was interested in the idea that the challenges that are placed to parental love consist not only of sort of biological um, factors um, uh, like dwarfism or Down syndrome, but also depend on what your child has done. And I was struck by the fact that while we used to blame parents um, uh, for autism by saying they had refrigerator mothers and for schizophrenia by saying the parents nurtured an unconscious wish that their child not exist. And if we go back 200 years, we used to say that um, children were born with dwarfism or deformities because of the unexpressed lascivious um, uh, longings of the mother. And we've dropped parental blame in all of those instances, but we still blame parents over and over again when their children do something atrocious and horrifying. And we still comfort ourselves by saying, well, in our household, things like that wouldn't have happened. And so I went off to interview a lot of uh, children of... Uh, people who, I mean, a lot of parents of people who'd committed crimes, and a lot of people who themselves had committed crimes, but I eventually made my way to um, to the parents of Dylan Klebold, and I remember um, uh, they didn't want to talk to me. It took me years to persuade them to do so, and on the uh, at the end of the first weekend we spent together, we were all exhausted. We had recorded 20 hours of interviews. We were sitting in the kitchen on Sunday night, and Sue Klebold was making some dinner, and I said, if Dylan were here now, is there anything you'd want to ask him? And his father said, there sure is. I'd want to ask him what the hell he thought he was doing. And his mother sort of looked at the floor, and she thought for a minute. And then she said, I would ask him to forgive me for being his mother and never knowing what was going on inside his head. And a couple of years later, I was at one of many dinners I had with Sue Klebold. They were among the people I got to know extremely well and spent a lot of time with. Um, we were having dinner in Denver, and I reminded her of that first conversation. And she said, you know, when it first happened, I used to wish I had never married, that I had never had children. If I hadn't gone to Ohio State, I wouldn't have crossed paths with Tom. We wouldn't have had these children, and this terrible thing wouldn't have happened. She said, but over time, I've come to feel that I love the children I had so much that I don't want to imagine a life without them, even at the price of this pain. When I say that, I'm speaking about my own pain, of course, and not the pain of other people. But life is full of suffering, and this is mine. So while I know it would have been better for the world if Dylan had never been born, I've decided that it would not have been better for me. And I thought that was a, a really extraordinary moment to... Um, to have arrived at. And she later wrote a book for which I wrote the introduction about her experience as his mother again in hopes that it would help people. And I, since I wrote that, I was contacted by the um, father of Adam Lanza who committed the Newtown murder. I was um, contacted by the father of James Holmes who did the movie theater shooting in Colorado. Um, I've been contacted by these parents over and over again. And over and over again, they seem like really good people who were doing their best. There are some people who end up creating, uh, committing crimes because they've been abused and traumatized, and that's a way of expressing their anguish. But there are a lot of people who have been well-loved, 
who nonetheless, for reasons that I don't think we understand, go off in this direction. Question down there. Thank you so much for your work. My um, teenage daughter, who was supposed to be everything college-bound from go to law school, go to medical school. She didn't know what she wanted to do. Then she read your book, and she decided, I want to become an advocate for people who have autism, and I want to fight for voters' rights for people with disabilities. Wow. Um, so thank you for that. What advice do you have for caregivers who work with people who are thought of as lesser human beings than other people? What advice can you give people that we could, we could learn from? Well, first of all, that's deeply meaningful to me to know about your, um, your daughter, and I thank you for telling me that. Um, I'll go home with a little glow tonight. Uh, I think uh, the advice for caregivers is first and foremost to treat people with dignity, which I think most caregivers strive to do and most caregivers actually manage to do. I think caregivers often can help to negotiate between the person who is disabled and different and the family of that person and the community that may exist. I think caregivers can introduce people into the sense that their difference is part of a community. I mean, we had Luini in the film saying, is there anybody else out there like me? And I feel like one of the things caregivers can do is say, yes, there are other people out there like you. I mean, one of the questions that I get asked, which sort of relates to yours, but it's a slight um, uh, uh, oblique answer to your question, is um, uh, what is it that children should uh, be told when they're growing up with these differences? And do you take your child and put your child into a context in which he's only with other people who share his difference or disability? Or do you put your child in a mainstream um, environment in which that isn't the case? And the conclusion I eventually came to is that Everyone needs both. You know, I think it would be strange and sad for me not to know any gay people, and I think it would also be sort of strange and sad if I didn't have many or even most of my friendships, given the proportions in the world's population, outside of that community. And I think balancing those two things can be incredibly difficult. Um, and I think it's one of the things that caregivers can do. And I think it's one of the things that happens in any form of group caregiving is that people who have a variety of differences and a variety of similarities are able to discover that they can connect both on the grounds of the similarities and on the grounds of the differences. And I think that's a tremendous form of support to be able to give. The question of siblings is one that comes up over and over again. There is a sort of basic principle that if you are a parent and you have a child, that you have some responsibility for taking care of that child. There is no comparable social expectation that siblings have to take care of their siblings. I found that some siblings were very interested in the differences that their, um, uh, that their brothers or sisters had and went into for example, the helping professions because of their exposure to that vulnerability, and some really wanted to just get out of there and have a different life. I was very struck by a sort of shift that took place in the um, uh, 70s that I think is very telling. For a long time, people had been told, oh, if you have a child with differences or disabilities, get that child away and out of the house and institutionalized because otherwise you'll be too distracted to take care of your other children. And then around the 70s, people started to notice actually what that does is persuade the children who are still at home that if they ever got sick or had a problem, they too would be sent up to an institution and left alone there. And so they decided it was really much better to have the disabled sibling live at home. But what's striking to me in that narrative shift is that it focuses entirely on what is to the advantage of the non-disabled sibling and very little on what is to the advantage of the disabled sibling. It's much better that families keep people at home and families at least who are able to are deeply involved in those children's care and in where they go. 
often siblings will realize that their parents won't live forever and they'll take a certain amount of responsibility. But it's really tough. And parents who have um, uh, non-disabled children who are in the household have to recognize that there is a bit of heroism in those siblings taking on day after day the defense of and the engagement with and the um, working with the, um, uh, the children who are disabled. Um, and that recognition, I think, is, is really critical. And I think often you find people will say, what well, one of the siblings of a boy who has both Down syndrome and autism, um, who I wrote about in the book, not a boy, a man, really, a young man, um, but his sister said, you know, on any given day, I'm incredibly annoyed that we have to stay home because of Adam, that I can't be in the living room because of Adam, that we have to eat that weird food because of Adam. She said, but overall, the idea of not having Adam in my life is a terrible idea, and I would never want that to happen. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you so much for your work. My question is, is, is there hope? And, and hope in the sense of can we bring a larger community, the country, on board with, this, with broadening this sense of community that is so healing? The individuals um, that the clips focused on a big component of the healing was in that sense of community and, and finding that validation of self, of worth, of dignity within that. But communities have borders. Is there hope to, the, to expanding that border to, to, the, to the country? Well, I'm sure I'm not supposed to talk about politics from this particular <laughs> podium. Um, but I would say that four years ago I was full of hope, and right now the hope feels very conditional. Um, despite the sort of, you know, the fact that we now have a president who mocked a disabled reporter and who's done all of these other things that have constricted the rights and access of people with a variety of differences um, and have in many instances stigmatized them quite severely. Despite that, I think as a society, we have gradually moved toward greater acceptance. I think we have greater acceptance of people who are different. Theaters have special afternoons for people with autism. Even 10 years ago, nobody had ever heard of that. People with Down syndrome now receive um, uh, education through strategies that didn't even exist 20 years ago that are allowing them to be much higher functioning than it was previously assumed that they could be. Gay people are allowed to get married. Trans people are at least in many instances allowed to use the bathroom that fits with the gender they know themselves to be and so on and so forth. So I think overall we are making progress, but like any progress, you know, we make a great leap forward and then we sort of slide backward. And I'm afraid we live in a time of sliding backward. And I feel like what we have to do in this particular political and social moment is to find methods and um, uh, systems for giving people um, a sense of confidence and a sense of being, um, uh, being accepted and being loved. And, you know, to some extent, people loving their own children with autism influences the laws that are passed that create better programs for people with autism. To some extent, however, it's when the government actually seems to be engaging with these people and validating their lives by creating programs for them that families think, well, I guess it's not so bad, this thing that I have. And when the government withdraws from that role, not just the government in terms of its technical um, um, behavior, but the sort of overall um, uh, public discourse pulls away from that, I think the effects can be devastating. But look, nobody thought the Americans with Disabilities Act would pass, and it passed and this room is handicapped accessible, and so is pretty much every other meeting space in this hotel and pretty much everyone in this city. And I think that we are steadily moving toward recognizing the dignity of people we used to think of only as tragic. Thank you so much, Andrew. Really, it's been my pleasure.